There's a lot that goes into this bed fish. A lot. If you want to do it at the highest level. A lot. All right. So now we've gotten set up right. We've got the fish as comfortable as we can get her. We're set up right. Now what do we do? A, if you can at all, sometimes to cover their own dictates, you got to pitch it tight to them. That's another thing you can decide on your angle of approach, right? So if that fish, let's say you got a, a line of pond weed right here, right? This is a line of pond weed, right? And that fish is set up right here. Well, we don't want to drop the, the bait right on the fish's head, ever, if we can keep from it. So if the glare angle's not too bad and you can at all get away with it, you want to set up over here or over here so that you can pitch past the fish and swim it up to her. Okay? Because if she's up against something, you can't get behind her, that's a problem. Now, in a lot of the cleaner water on the lake right now, it's not an issue because they're setting up way out in the middle. They're setting up way off the bank. A lot of them are, especially the bigger ones. They're setting up way off the bank on beds that are harder to see. And we'll talk about how to find those here in a minute. But when they're out in the middle, you can set up on whatever, whatever angle you want because they're out in the middle. You can go past them no matter what your angle is. But when they're up against cover, you have to consider, how can I get this bait to land well behind the fish so I don't spook it when it crashes? You don't want to dive. I call it dive bomb. You don't want to dive bomb their head. You don't want to be out there dropping bombs on them, you know? So the first thing I want to do is get set up where I can pitch past the fish. My first pitch, I'm never, ever, ever on my first pitch going to try and put the bait in line with the fish where I'll actually contact the fish as I retrieve it back to me. Okay? Well, you know, I shake it through the bed. I don't want my bait to be in line with it. So if the fish, this is the head of the fish. There's, there's eyeballs. There, there's the head of the fish. That's the best drawing I got, boys. That's the best one I got. Mm -hmm. So the fish is set up like this. I want to pitch that bait. If I'm over here, I want to pitch that bait here so that I can bring that bait about six inches to a foot in front of it on the first pitch. I'm really on that first pitch just trying to gain, gauge their temperament. And I'm not really trying to make them bite yet. I'm just trying to see when that bait lands, is she going to run? When that bait swims up into the bed. Because... Is she going to run? When I start shaking her, is she going to run? And I don't want to do anything too aggressive. And if that fish just stays locked in and doesn't move, I'll inch closer and closer and closer until I'm dropping that bait right here and approaching basically her ear, the gill plate, right? But I'll do it a little bit at a time, pitch by pitch, as I get closer and closer until I get some type of reaction out of it. And I know I'm missing some stuff. That's why I wanted to prepare better than I did because I know... Like, as much as we're talking about it, I know there's some stuff I'm missing. Um, gauging their behavior. A lot of times you'll pitch it in there, and then what I'll do is I do, I call it the thumb and drag. Because <clears throat> you may pitch behind here, and she may be out here on the bed, and there may be some stuff back here, some pond weed or whatever, and you can pitch it on top of that pond weed and drag it across the top. But what you have to do is not engage your reel. When that bait hits, do not let it sink. Pitch it in there, thumb the spool, and just lift your rod. And drag it, and you want to drop it right behind the bed. You know, if the bed's right up against it, drop it in the back side of it. But if you can, drop it right behind the bed. Where that fish is sitting here, eyeballs, you throw your bait up here, you drag it, thumb it and drag it on the surface. I mean, drag it right on the surface where you can see the bait. Keep it above that grass. Drag it right to here and then drop it right behind the bed. And then you start just lightly shaking it. That's something I wanted to show y'all because... <laughs> I've told other people this, and, and I don't know if I have any customers in here that are sight fishing me. I don't think I do tonight. Not tonight. So, there's something about the cadence, the rhythm, the speed, and the gentleness in which you shake that bait in that bed that's better than others. Most people that get in my boat shake the bait too hard. They're almost hopping, hopping, hopping the bait instead of just... Like all you're wanting that bait to do is it comes down and it's the weight's resting and the claws are behind it. You really just want that bait to sit there and do this. And just barely maybe inch forward a little bit. But you just want it so it's a real light shake. So I'll pitch it in there and put this in my hands, I'll be like now that looks like my rod tip's moving a lot. But I'm also shaking this with slack line. So I'm just shaking the slack. Like the line's not even tight when I'm doing this. And it's just making that weight wiggle a little bit, making those claws wiggle a little bit, getting a little bit of that click. Click, 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 click with that bead, and the claws are just doing that thing. It's just a very, very light, I mean, it's a very light shake. And most people get motor doing this. You tell them shake it, and they go like this. Well, look how much my rod tip's moving when I do that. You'll see that? 
Let's see if we can do this on the camera. Like most people get in there and shake it like that, and they think, that, well, that's just shaking. And that is just shaking. But look how my rod is going from here to here. That's a foot, guys. That's a foot. Man, if your line ever gets tight when you're doing that, you just hop that bait all the way out of the bed right away. You just, I mean, you never even gave her a chance to look at it. And, and so the lightness and the speed, and just the faster you can do it, the better. The more you can make those claws wiggle fast, the more you make that bead go click, click, click faster, that's the better it is, really. And so I'm going to start out with just that shake. And there's kind of three different things that I do. We do shake it, and that's shake it. That's a light shake. It's very light shakes. And then we'll say hop it. And when I say hop it, I don't want you pulling the bait real far. I just want you kind of snapping the slack so it makes the bait go up down. So if, that, if you're shaking that bait, and when I'll hop it, if I'm shaking that bait and that fish comes up and looks at it and gets still, maybe he's six inches off it, two inches off it, but that fish comes up and looks at your bait as you're shaking it and kind of locks up and doesn't do anything for a couple, two or three seconds, I'll snap it and make that bait go choo choo and see if I can get a reaction out of the fish, right? And then the other thing I do that, that I think that, and this is something else that I, I don't know anybody else that does this, but, and I'm sure there are guys that do it because it's a pretty simple deal, but when I'm shaking it, when I decide to take that bait away from that fish, I snap it coming out. I again do the snap, hop, and then I reel it in. I want that bait to be sitting there, they're looking at it, looking at it, and it's gone out of the bed. Now, when I snap it to come out, I actually do pull the bait towards me a little bit. You still want to hop it and drop it so it goes, and then it swims out. But it's a more, it's a bigger hop as you're leaving. You want it to, that fish to be sitting there staring at that bait and then react as it goes out. And I'm telling you, when I do that a lot of times is when I'm shaking a bait, shaking a bait, maybe I'm hopping it, whatever I'm doing, maybe I gave it a hop, but that fish comes in and looks, the moment that fish turns away from it, so that fish comes in and looks at the bait, the second his head goes away from it, I snap it, I take it away from him. Don't let him look at it too long. If you let him start getting comfortable with that bait in the bed, you're losing time. You're, you're making it take longer. You're letting that fish get too comfortable with your bait. You want that bait in and out, in and out, in and out. Make it nervous. So the second that fish shows disinterest in my bait, we threw it in there. She came up to it. She's looking at it. She starts to, I mean, before she even touches it, right when she starts to turn, snap it away from her. And then reel it in as fast as you can and get it right back in there as fast as you can. That's another factor. I see guys, they pull the bait out and they sit there and they look at the fish and they talk. and they, Man, I don't know. Where should I be? You know, they think. Don't. Get it in there. In and out. In and out. Think about this. You're a fish. you got to protect that nest. There's a perceived threat there. You go up there. You start to decide it's not a threat. Then it gets your attention because it's gone. And now you have time to relax and there's no threat in your bed. All you did was take that fish's temperature. You're trying to make that fish's temperature elevate. You're trying to make their frustration level get worse. And when you, the longer you leave that bait out of that bed, the more time that fish has to calm down and cool back off. So you're just making it take longer. So if that fish is in there, threat, I ain't worried about that threat. Where, what's it doing? And then boom, it's right here again. There's the threat again. So you just always want to get that bait in there as fast as you can. If you have two guys, it works. If you have two guys and both of y'all can pitch really accurate, uh, something that works really well, so me and Cody are doing it. As soon as I pull the bait out of the bed, Cody's bait goes in as I'm winding it in. That fish really has no time to breathe in. It's always a new threat coming in. And so if you've got a team partner in a tournament or something, you can just in and out, in and out. The faster you can do it, the better. You're going to irritate them that much faster. And that's the fun part about it is you're taking a fish that in a lot of cases, no matter how good you do on the approach and all that, a lot of times that fish is aware you're there. Most of the time, that fish is aware that your boat's there. Uh, and a lot of these pressure fish, they don't want to bite that bait. They don't want to bite that bait. Um, they've been caught before a lot of times, you know, they, so they don't want to bite that bait. And you're still going to irritate that fish and through your ability to read their behavior, be accurate, and be fast, you're going to make that fish bite. And that, is that not what bass fishing is? We're all out here throwing plastic and metal around trying to make a, a fish bite something that isn't real. And there's no finer example of that than sight fish. Wow, I love it so much. It, it, that's the game, man. Now this fish, you can see this fish and you're making him bite. As pure as it can be. It's pure. It's like the purest form of bass fishing to me. This fish knows you're there. He's scared of you. He doesn't want to bite this bait and you're still going to make him bite. It's really cool. Oh, uh, let's see what else. superstition when you're going down the bank don't worry about changing your colors i like watermelon red but as you can see we ran out of watermelon red and i didn't even bother buying any i just went to green pumpkin because i still got the red bead i think there is a little bit to having some red on your bait is, is a key deal a little bit but 
I'm not a fan of throwing white, but white can do it. The color doesn't matter. It's really about reading that fish's behavior, making that fish comfortable, reading their behavior, and then keeping that bait on them and irritating them until they bite. So any color can work. On this lake where everybody's throwing white, white's just a more, what's a good word for it? Just, it's just a more like blatantly glaring, bright, hard color. Visual color. So, yeah, it's very. I think people throw it so they can actually see their bait. And That's what we're about to talk about next. Yeah, people do throw it so they can so they can see the fish eat the bait. That's the whole reason to throw it. It's the only reason to throw white because you. It's not because you think white's gonna make the fish bite, so you can see them eat it. Uh, we'll talk about how that's wrong here in just a second. What? Because that's wrong. Seeing the fish eat the bait is hey. Seeing the fish eat the bait is wrong. It's wrong. You don't want to do that. I like to throw natural colors. I feel like they're more prone to bite a natural color. I like the red highlights. Red I think is a good trigger color for fish for whatever reason in the springtime or really kind of year round in East Texas, red's kind of a good color to throw on just about anything. Um, but it could be green pumpkin, it could be black blue, it could be Jumbo, it doesn't matter. I know Zach used to throw Jumbo all the whole time. Jumbo red though, it had red flake. Yeah, you say. Red in the bed. Yep. Yeah, red on a bit. Now, let's talk about why white, why seeing the fish bite the bait on a bed is the wrong thing to do. It's the wrong thing, especially for inexperienced bed fishermen. What's going to happen is you're going to have fish that don't want to bite and you finally coax them in. They're getting really close and they're going to start doing this. They're going to like pump their tail and swim down and they may even bump your line and they may even bump your bait, but they didn't eat it. But when you see them do this and they block out your white bait, you're going to swing. And what you're going to do is you're going to smack that fish in the face way too hard and you're going to spook them. And you just started your clock over, Jack. And it's, it's a race, guys. Remember. The fa it's all about how fast you can catch them off bed. The faster you can catch them, the faster you can go find more. So if you smack that fish in the face because you weren't that fish didn't really bite, but you thought you did because the bait disappeared, you just started your clock over. You just you just kill you're killing yourself. So I don't like white. I actually not only do I want to feel the fish bite, I want to feel the fish move the bait. Like I'll feel fish bite sometimes and still just kind of keep shaking. Because they will bite and spit so fast there's no way you're gonna catch them. Or they'll just bite the tail. Like if I feel a fish bite the bait and move it, now I'm quick. Once I feel a fish bite the bait and actually move it, I have a much better chance of that fish having the hook in the mouth. And if you catch them outside the mouth and you snag them, you can't keep, you can't keep them in a tournament anyway. It's not a legal catch. You've got to catch them in the mouth when you sight fish. Everybody knows that, right? Yeah, okay. So I don't like white. I don't want to see the fish eat the bait. And I dang sure don't want any experienced guide customers seeing them eat the bait. I want them to feel that fish move that bait before they swing. In fact, that big one at 11, she did. You, you hear me in the video go, oh, she just bit it. But she bit it, and I didn't feel her there afterwards, so I didn't swing. And to be totally honest with you, there is a very high probability that if I would have felt that bite and swung, that I wouldn't have caught that fish. I can tell you this because the very next day, <laughs> a big one bit the customer's bait, and he swung and missed him, and we never, we, that fish was locked. I mean, she was giant. She was probably another real close to 10 pounds. She was locked. She was ready to bite. She was more ready than the 11 was when we, when we found her. And she, she bit, but didn't get the whole bait. And he felt her bite and swung, and we never saw her again after that. She never even got near the bed after that. That's the really giant ones. When you start talking about these 10 plus pounders, man, you're going to usually get one chance. And they're usually only there for one day. Some of them will be there multiple days. There are some big ones that are still dumb, but uh, most of them really giant fish are going to give you one chance and they're only going to be there for one day. You can't screw those up. <laughs> no pressure, right? <laughs> but um, that's why I think white's wrong. I mean, I just, I just don't like white. Um, I guess we should move on and talk about how to find the deeper beds, the ones that are harder to see that most people miss, and dirty water. Um, it, it's a very similar process. The, really what you're dealing with is just fish that you can't see. And, and before we talk about that, let me say this. So whenever I'm going through an area, depending on the water clarity is going to depend on how close to the bank I get. Right? So what I want to do is get where I can barely see the bottom. Like I can just kind of make out the dark and light spots on the bottom just barely. I want my boat just outside of that. And I want to pan from there to the bank, from there to the bank, from there to the bank. And really what I'm looking for more than anything when I'm searching is just movement, guys. I'm just looking for a fish to move. A lot of times it'll be their tail 
it moves that you can see. I want to get right where I can just barely make out the light and dark differences on the bottom and get just outside of that and look from there to the bank and look for movement. A lot of times their tail is going to be the thing you see. You know, it'll just be, sometimes it'll just be a light little wave. And even the ones that won't move, their tail will move around a little bit. So you're just looking for, it's like everybody deer hunt, everybody deer hunt, everybody deer hunt, right? Everybody, all of us fishermen pretty much deer hunt. Right? So I don't really deer hunt anymore. I do this year round now, but I did deer hunt a lot growing up. And when you're in South Texas and them deer are gray and all the brush is gray, you're really just looking for movement. It's what you're looking for. Same thing. This is the hunting of bass fishing. That's what sight fishing is. It really marries hunting and fishing together is what it does. Um, but when the water gets dirty, or you're starting to see some beds out in deep water where you really can't see fish on them, what I do is probably the opposite of what you would think you should do. Most people probably think, well, if you can't see them that good, you need to slow down and look more carefully. Uh-uh. Turn the trolling motor volume up a little bit and buzz their tower. Make them move. Make them move fast. Don't worry about scaring them. They'll come back once your boat's gone. I promise you they will. If they were on that spot till your boat got right up on them, they're coming back to it when your boat leaves. Okay? But using that same process where I go past them, so I'll buzz their tower and actually make them run hard where they'll kick up clouds of dust and you'll see them. Because the faster that fish moves off the bed, the easier it's going to be, be to see them in low visibility, right? Does that make sense? So, so if it's really dirty water, I'll get tied to the bank and I'll buzz down that sucker and I'll make noise with my trolling motor on purpose to make those fish run hard. And then I can see them when they leave. And if that fish lets me get close enough to see it in dirty water with my boat making all that noise, the odds are that fish is going to go back to that bed and be willing to bite. But now I know where he is, I can loop back around, set up where I really can't see him, and start the whole process that we talked about all night. But the whole deal about, you know, I've, I've had people tell me, man, it's too dirty to sight fish. And I love it when people, I like it when it's cloudy. I like it when it's windy. I like it when the water's stained because a lot of people give up on sight fishing. And then I get more of them to myself. Because you can still find them, but my biggest secret to finding fish in low visibility, whether it's deeper, windy, cloudy, muddy water, any low visibility issues, my biggest secret to finding them is to make more noise, move faster, make the fish leave the bed faster. They become more obvious. You can see where they're at, and then you can look back around and take your time to set up. Now, does it reduce my efficiency? Yes, it does. Because even though I'm driving faster, once I set up on them, I'm more prone to make a mistake on reading the fish's behavior because I can't see it very good. I can't see the movement of the fish nearly as good when I'm at distance in the, in the lower visibility conditions. So it will slow me down in a lot of ways and, and cause me to go slower throughout the day and not be able to find as many. So it does reduce my effectiveness. But it can still be done. And if you've got some locked on bed fish on a pond like this and there's not a lot of other people fishing for them, you don't need to catch very many to have one heck of a day. You know what I'm saying? Because you just go till you find the right ones and then you only need to catch six or eight or ten and you I mean six or eight or ten the right ones out here can be the day of your life right everybody knows that so uh you know and i've heard some contradictory stuff uh, i haven't i don't especially this time of year man i don't have time to watch any content fishing shows i mean i haven't watched any bassmaster live the last two days and i love the elite series you know and i haven't watched any of them um but i, I did have some content brought to my attention that was very contradictory to what I've been talking about. And all I want to say that, I don't want to say anything to slight anybody in any way. I really don't. And I'm not going to. But I'll say this. In every different bite when it comes to bass fishing, whether it's a deep cranking bite or a swim bait bite or a sight fishing bite or a frog bite or whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. There's going to be guys that are on that bite and are catching them and are really good at that bite and they're catching them. And there's going to be guys that aren't very good at that bite and think that bite ain't that great. It ha it's happening right now at the Sabine River. It's going to happen when they come here to Fork. There's going to be guys that are whacking them on shallow points and other guys that can't catch them on shallow points. And they're the best in the world. There's going to be guys that are catching them on beds in that Elite Series tournament here. There's going to be guys that can't catch them off the of beds here. They're too pressured. They can't. They're going to say all the things. Right? So the lake has been absolutely on fire for spawning fish. I was presented some content that contradicted that and said that it was not definitely not no matter what anybody says. We probably caught 35 off beds yesterday. Bed fishing is a time-consuming gig, man. If you can catch 30 of them off a of bed, that's on fire to me. In my book, that's on fire. You catch 30 fish off beds. And it ain't like we were stopping on dinks. Like the only smaller ones we stopped on had a big female with them. So most of, most of that, other than like two or three, every fish we caught was at least three or four pounds. So that's a pretty good day. 30 fish over three or four pounds. I think that's on fire in my opinion. So... 
Uh, and every day this week before that was not much different. It's been really good, really good. And y'all, y'all have seen some of the really giant fish that we've caught lately on beds too. So um, that's all I'll say is, you know, if you consume, and I encourage you to consume other people, other fishing guides out here that make content, other fishermen, professional fishermen as they travel the country, make. I absolutely encourage you to consume all of it because I'm certainly not the end all to be on. I'm not the smartest, best teacher when it comes to this this game. By any means, I'm not even close. Uh, so I would, I would, if I had the time, would consume all that content trying to learn myself. But what I will say is when somebody presents something in somewhat of an absolute manner or tries to be contradictory, you need to maybe just think about how fishing really is. We all have our good days and bad days. We all have our strengths and weaknesses. And sometimes some guys catch them this way, and that other guy can't really catch them that way. And that's just all there is to that. And then there's going to be times when that guy's going to catch them the way he likes to catch them, and this guy's not going to do very good. Okay, and that's going to happen. It happens to me all the time. There's bites that happen out here that I'm not as good at, and I watch guides every day whoop my freaking butt. It happens. It happens always. So. Um, what else? Any questions? So I know you have a lot of fish on beds. Mm -hmm. Up shallow that you can see. Yeah. But have you tried to back out and use your active target to find a bed fish that's I have not. five or six foot? You know, something I actually, and I, I'm, I'm really excited about using the active target and the 360 and all that. Actually, my 360 is so big, and the way they mounted it up above my I took it off. Because <laughs> I'm always right on the nose of the boat trying to sight fish. So I actually <laughs> took the 360 off the bracket this week because it was getting in my way. Um, <laughs> just while I'm bed fishing. It's just OCD about how his boat looks. Just while I'm bed fishing, that's all it is. Just while I'm bed fishing, it'll be back. No, I really like the way it looks when it's on there. I just it was in my way, dog. Like it's, it's a big graph. Uh, it's in my truck. It's in my truck right now. My boat's not even here. My graph is. It's in my truck. Um, wait a minute. Hold on. Somebody gonna break in my truck now. <laughs> no, it's in my garage at home. It's locked up in a safe. Uh, it's right yeah. next to the ladder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to the what? Right, right next to the ladder. The ladder that's in my garage. Yeah. In your boat. Oh, there's a ladder. Oh, yeah, the ladder. My boat. No, what? I, I, you lost me for a second because I couldn't remember if you were in my garage or not because I actually have an old boat ladder that broke on me that's in my garage. So, mm -hmm. like one of the ones that fold down. I broke one day I was driving on the lake and the boat ladder breaks and it falls in the water and it's on the passenger side and we're on plane and it falls in the water and somehow it sprays water and the water's like funneling up and just soaking my customers. <laughs> and they're like, they're like, why are we getting wet? I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea what's happening. I'm not getting any of it. They're just getting soaked. <laughs> and finally, I figured it out. I had, to, I had to actually get in the water and take the ladder all the way off uh, in the middle of the day. Now that we're on that subject, can I explain why I use the ladder? Why is that? Because I can be twice the distance as you and see much more up in front of me from that yeah. angle that what the ladder lets me be at. Man, I, I, I understand the theory in that, and there are moments, there are times when I would agree with that. Most of the time, with the glare angles, I feel like if you use the glare angles to your advantage, a lot of times you can actually see further from lower vantage points. I just, in my experience, there are a lot of times throughout the day, especially around here, with this more stained water and stuff, and wind always blowing you I, can i think what it is is it's like hunting mm -hmm. if you're looking straight toward the horizon with the sun you get a lot of glare but yeah. if you can look down from the glare there's not as much glare yeah now if you're looking straight down it's an advantage to be higher but i'm always trying to look out and when i look out like being higher is not really helping me any you still you still have that angle down though mm -hmm. the farther out you go compared to i mean i tried it i used to keep a yeti cooler and my boat stood on that it didn't help me any <coughs> I know there's a lot of guys that believe that. I know. I know there is. There is a lot of guys that believe that. And I don't know. Maybe there's just a difference because maybe, maybe it is better in some ways. But maybe there's a difference because what, I, what happens is I see guys on ladders that don't see fish that I see without one. And I just look at it and I'm like, and then sometimes like I'll be on the trolling motor and I'll be standing up like this. And there's times when I'm going down the bank like this because the glare, like, I just, the glare is a little better. Like, I don't know. I'm just... Maybe it's just I spend so much time looking at them, I can see them a little better than most guys. So maybe that's why I'm seeing the fish that the ladder guys, some of the ladder guys aren't. Well, I've seen a lot of the ladder guys troll the bank three foot, two foot of water. Two I know. There's a difference. Yeah. Like me, I'm out I there. I guess if you know how to use I'm the ladder, it can be a tool. Right. than you are. That's yeah. what's great about the all tracks because I have the remote. Mm -hmm. And I can be way out there. My second question is, how the hell do you not ever hit a stump and fall off? 
I know you strap the ladder down, but like, do you strap yourself to the ladder? Like, if you hit a stump, do you not fall off? No, I've got a, I've got a ladder that kind of. Bro, I can't hardly walk without falling down. So <laughs> Maybe that's the brown water. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Anyways, just sure, I guess agree to disagree. I don't know. I've tried getting a higher vantage point. It, it, I just didn't see that. Really? I've noticed the last couple of days. Big fish out in about four foot of water just cruising. Mm -hmm. are, those, are those the ones that are looking for a bed? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. typically. I mean, it could be one that's, you know, immediate post that's pulled off the well, bed. Well, in this one particular area, I mean, there was probably seven or eight fish yeah. that were probably 20 inches or better. Well, here's the key point. You said that last couple days. Uh -huh. You said last couple days, right? Here's the key point. New moon's this weekend. New moon's what, tomorrow? Is it tomorrow or Sunday? Or, to or tonight? There's a new moon in the next three days. So what you're getting is a new wave of females. And if you go around and look, there's a ton of fish on beds. And there are some females up. And that's I'm glad you brought this up because this is another good point of discussion when it comes to bed fishing as far as understanding what's going on. Uh, when the females will be present is a combination of two factors. It's a combination of moon cycle, yes. But it's also a combination of water temperature. Because what I saw at the end of last week and beginning of this week was even though we were dead middle between full moon and new moon, you shouldn't have any new, like by the moon wave theory, you don't have any new ones pulling in halfway between. But yet, we had such an increase in water temperature early this week that there were females that pulled in and locked on and we caught big ones early in the week. And at the end of last week, Friday we had big ones, you know. Uh, Friday we had a nine something, like, and I don't fish on the weekends because, you know, our family have a on that, but uh, Friday and Monday, Tuesday, we caught big fish. There was like, it was like that little heat wave, that temperature increase. We had the cold front last week. Like I came back from the weekend. It got really warm at the beginning of the week and over the weekend. That little temperature increase in these pockets forced some of those females to come up and lock on. Not a huge amount, but some. But now as we got to the end of the week, it was a lot of males on beds. And the ones that did have females, the females were real flighty. They didn't want to stay around. They weren't really committed yet. And now you're talking about seeing a bunch of big cruisers. Well, we got a new moon coming up. And what's going to happen is those ones that are cruising, a lot of those fish are going to pair up day after, two days after the, the new moon and be really catchable within the next three days after the new moon. Sunday night. Sunday night's the new moon? There you go. So those fish are just getting in there, checking out the scenery, eating a little shad, checking out the potential boyfriends. It's like Match.com in these pockets right now. Right? Like maybe, maybe Tinder. I don't know. Fish ain't real loyal, so... Anyways, they're looking for they're looking for a mate, and usually, in my experience, you'll have some of them lock on the day after the moon cycle. But really, about three days after is when you get the most numbers of females that will go ahead and lock on and be aggressive and wanting to fight. So the cooler the cooler weather next week and highs in the sixties and lows in the forties that gonna hurt it. <laughs> is that gonna hurt it? Uh, no, no. The train has left the tracks. It could it could it make the fish a little more reluctant to bite? Yes. Is it gonna put the brakes on the process in any way? No, not really. It's still going to happen. The fish might get harder to catch, more reluctant, less aggressive. Um, but as far as the fish going and doing their spawning thing, that train's left the tracks, brother. And it's, you know, highs in, the water temp's well into the 60s now. So highs in the 60s or 70s is not going to just totally derail that water. Now, if it, if it got cold enough to drop that water back into the 50s, yeah, they'd pull out. They'd pull off. Like, and they'd just kind of pull off and hang out in the middle of the cove, and the very next time it got warm enough, they'd all run back. But yeah, like when we had those 37 degree mornings, yeah. what would happen is, and, and this may happen with the cooler temps too, in the morning, like you saw bed fish yesterday afternoon, in the morning they're not in there. But by the time the afternoon comes back around, they're back in there again. They just pull off for that cold air and get a little bit deeper and then they go back up to that bed when it gets a little warmer. That did happen last week in those, those two really, really cold mornings for sure. We were out on one of those. Mm -hmm. Hey, those cold mornings didn't derail bedfish because the, the video y'all saw Wednesday was filmed on one of those 37 degree mornings. When I caught the 11 pattern, we caught a bunch of the males on beds like quick. So those cold mornings will not remove them from beds. It may make it take a little longer throughout the day for them to get there. It may make them a little harder to catch, but it's not going to stop them. Once they start spawning, spawning, you can't stop them. Are they pretty much spawning the whole lake now? Or? Yeah, yeah, there's some fish spawning the whole lake. Now, some of the far northern reaches have a lot of post spawn. Excuse me, have a good amount of post spawn fish, a solid amount of post spawn fish. Um, but there's still spawners up there, but you can't really see them. 
that water's a lot of that water's too dirty. Yeah. Even using the dirty water techniques to find them, it's just too dirty to see them in a lot of areas. There's some areas, but a lot most are hard to see. Like if you go up in the far north end of Birch, or you go up to the Lake Fork Creek Highway 19, you're not going to see fishing. Um, but there's some spawning. Make no mistake. But there's but the good thing is in those are a lot of post spawn fish. And then that dirty water now. When we started getting numbers of spawners all over the lake, I just went to sight fishing, pretty much almost exclusively. Um, but right before that happened, I was throwing a black and blue swim jig, and a, if there wasn't a lot of like hydrilla I was throwing a black and blue swim jig. It was like flooded vegetation, pond weed, buck brush, stuff like that. I was throwing a black and blue swim jig. If there was coontail hydrilla, I was throwing a black and blue chatterbait in that really dirty water on the far northern reaches, and I was catching those post spawners doing that pretty, pretty fair. I mean, not great, but. You know, when everybody was struggling, it was cold and water dirty. I was, you know, getting some good bites. It was, it was a nice little buffer to get it, go get a few solid bites. So that's something you can do. If that water's real dirty, I'm telling you, black and blue swim jig or black and blue chatterbait when that water's dirty is a really good tool. Mm -hmm. You know, so much of fishing on bait selection is, it's not about necessarily even what you think that you know. It's not like a random what are they going to bite the best. There's times when it's a what are they going to bite the best. Most of the time it's not a random what are they going to bite the best. It's what can I fish the present cover the most efficiently with. So like when I had Hydrilla Kuntel, I was throwing a chatterbait because it's great in that submergent vegetation. When I had flooded cover, emergent vegetation, or flooded bushes, the swim jig's a much more efficient option in that cover. So whatever cover the fish had present to relate to in those areas where I wanted to fish, I would throw the bait that I could fish most efficiently in those areas. Yeah. If you watch the pros, it's not about the bait that they think they're going to bite the best a lot of times. It's about the bait they can fish the most efficiently with. Now, different genres of techniques, uh, weightless plastics, winding baits, top waters, that's about what they're going to bite the best right now. You know, does that make sense? Like, one guy might throw a wacky one, one guy might throw a fluke, and they're all catching the same fish. One guy might throw a chatterbait, one guy might throw a swim jig, and all catch the same fish. One guy might throw a square bill, catch those fish. But it, it becomes about what you can fish through the cover the best. Any more questions? No? How'd we do? Was that a good one? I tried. I tried hard to get everything I could. I probably missed some stuff, but uh, I really, if you guys can't tell, I really like sight fishing. I get excited about it, and I get the luxury of seeing a lot of different people do it in my boat and seeing a lot of different people in the lake do it. So I want to try and help you guys every way that I could. So I hope we did that. Um, Y'all go down there and get some raffle tickets and buy some six inch baits, right? Let's go do that. Hey, thank y'all for coming. Thank you guys for watching and thank you to Lake Fort Marina for letting me.